I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. In this episode, I talk to Ben and Susan Borland, missionaries to Montevideo, Uruguay. Listen as they share about their first year on the mission field. They talk about their first impressions after landing in Montevideo, what the country is like, the challenges they've faced, and their plans for their second year. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I want to thank you so much for listening to the Rob Skinner Podcast. Man, I really, really appreciate your support. I recently got two anonymous uh, donations from uh, listeners, which I was so grateful for, from my Buy Me a Coffee app that I have in the show notes. I really appreciate it. And also, I got a nice letter and card from Bill Katona. I appreciate his support. Thank you so much, Bill, for your supporting the program. If you feel like you're benefiting from the program, I'd like to ask you to support it with a gift. Your support enables me to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches and inspire others to do the same through this podcast. All you need to do is simply go to the show notes and there's a link to support the program. Speaking of support, thanks to a generous gift from one of my listeners, I have funding to support a campus minister this coming school year. Thank you so much. I've already hired a young woman who'll be helping this fall, and I'm now looking for a young man to lead our campus ministry at the University of Arizona this coming school year. We can provide $2,000 per month and the opportunity to learn and grow on one of the best campuses in the country. The campus ministry has bounced back from a low of three disciples after COVID and now has more than 10 fired up disciples who want to make this life count. If you're interested or if you know of someone who'd be perfect for this, please email me at rob at robskinner.com. That's rob at robskinner.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Ben and Susan, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having us again. It is great to see you guys and to be with you. I, I, I know it's been, let's see, how long has it been since you guys took off to go to Montevideo? A little bit over a year. A little we bit. We arrived May 31st, 2023. Okay. So, okay. So it's just been a little over the, a year. It's, this, it's the first day of winter down there. It's it's a hundred. It's going to be 111 here in Tucson today. Okay. On June 21st. So I don't know what the temperature is like there, but we are opposites. What, yeah. If you guys, I, I'm just looking forward to talking to you about your experience this first year on the mission field. You guys came from Oklahoma City. What was it like landing in Montevideo? Okay, you've got your kids. You have three kids, right? Okay. Yes. What was that? Can you just describe what was that like, just kind of stepping off the plane and just coming into a foreign country? Uh, Sure. Uh, We got to visit the country twice before, once on an interview and then uh, for spring break with our kids uh, for a week. So um, it felt like we had already done some test runs. And uh, but this felt real when we had like 20 pieces of luggage and (laughs) push, push, you know, two to three, you know, luggage carriers through there with you know, after 20 hours of time in airports and planes uh, with three, you know, elementary age kids, it was, uh, uh, it was exhausting. And uh, in our, in the trip that we took in spring break, we lost some bags. So we thought, okay, we already expected the worst, like we might lose some things, but everything went through. And uh, so we packed up a lot of kitchenware and you know, some, uh, some electronics and all of our clothes with us and, um, and, uh, had to take a giant van, uh, yeah. to, to our waiting, uh, apartment. So, yeah, I had like chartered like a probably 20 person van 
to take us because we said we would rather have like way too much space than not enough. Right. And so there was like a van waiting to pick us up and we like flew through customs and it was cold. I remember it was like cold and gray. And um, we like hopped on the van and then we came to our really cold house because um, we don't have like central heat or air. What? Um, we actually... We actually heat our house with a fireplace <laughs> and once, once a month or like every five weeks, we get a ton of firewood delivered, like a literal ton of firewood delivered, but it takes, it took us like probably six or seven weeks to figure that out before someone was like, wait, you're just like buying 10 kilos of firewood at the grocery store and walking home with it. They were like, that's not going to work. So like pe the people started giving us phone numbers of delivery people that bring wood to your house. <laughs> so we were just cold for like, <laughs> it was amazing. Well, also uh, Uruguay is going through a drought. It's one of the oh, few yeah. places you can drink from the tap and flush toilet paper in South America, but you can do that because of the drought they're experiencing. So I was like carrying 14 liters of water and like 10 kilos of wood from the grocery store, like every day. Like a real it, man. It felt like I was supporting a village. <laughs> um, and I think we were also, we were cold and I think we were just like dehydrated for like six weeks because we didn't realize that like everybody kind of goes to their corner store for little things. Like you don't go to like the big grocery, like, you know how you do like a Walmart haul or a right, Target haul? Right, or... right. Um, here it's like, yes, you can do that. But like, you kind of go to your corner store when you need to top up something. We didn't realize that our corner store had like gallons of water or not gallons, like seven liter containers. It's huge. I mean, it's like huge. So it was just, it was a huge learning curve at first. It was a huge learning curve. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're heat, you're heating your place with a, a fireplace. Yes. yes. Right now we are. Yes. Right now. It's also our building dryer. <laughs> it's uh, it's like that game, uh, the show survivor. We both know how to make fires. We're so them. good at making fires. But you it's guys, honest. you guys are in, in the city limits, right? Of Montevideo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. you're heating with wood. Okay, so here's the thing it, is that if we lived in a really big uh, like apartment building, we would pay for like um, a doorman and we would pay really expensive. They're called gastos comunes. So everybody pays like like a flat rate flat rate for heat, no air, but like heat, water, doorman. But sometimes it costs as much as your rent. And so we, we technically live in a house, but to me, it feels like an apartment because we have upstairs neighbors and we share a wall. Um, but so we don't have to pay those common expenses. So we, we have, we could, you know, if we lived in an apartment, like we could have those things, but, but you also don't get to control your heat in the winter. And we have so many friends that are like, they have, they're opening the windows in the winter because it's just so hot. They wake up and their mouths are dry. And so we've heard horror stories on the flip side. So we have like a large common space in our house and it's always warm. Like we figured out how to keep it warm. And then everybody's bedroom is kind of, it's cooler, but we have like hot water bottles and heated sheets and stuff like that. And so you just kind of go in your room at night and actually, I think you sleep better in the cool air. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's okay. That's interesting. So Ben, uh -huh. tell me about language. Let's, let's talk about language school. You came in there with, you know, you, you were doing a little bit of self-study. Susan, yeah, you, zero, you zero. studied that's Spanish, right. as I recall, in college. So you, yeah. you already knew how to speak. Let's talk about your language acquisition. Yeah, well, Susan has been on a learning journey as well, and, and she'll share. But uh, yeah, for me, it's uh, <laughs> I've tried to pick up a language a handful of times, and uh, e even for the sake of Jesus, it's like oh, it'd be really good to know a second language. But you know, you're you're so entrenched in the U.S. You know, with English, right. it's it's um, so it's unless you. Uh, really go after it, it becomes really difficult. And, and and so, you know, I think probably as Americans, we just say, well, we just assume that immersion is always best. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I think it is best, but you make a million mistakes <laughs> in the first week. So, yes. and, and then you'll make 
the same mistake a million times before someone corrects you, um, you know, where they're like, oh, that word doesn't mean to speak slowly. That means glass lenses. And you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> like, the real story. That's, a, that's my story. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, but even with advances like using Google Translate and, you know, you're not going to get, you know, the it's local the colloquial thing, because I think Google Translate is more like European España, Espanol, and not Latin America, and then even then it becomes very patchy. Um, so it's it's so it's moments where you're like, okay, well, I'll just depend on Google Translate in a moment. It just doesn't work well for either party. Um, so yeah, it's been interesting. I've done I did an on I've done an online program. Uh, then I I sought out a private tutor uh, with two other missionaries uh, that were here to help us to learn. Um, and then they went on for like a summer break for a couple months. Like my school was just closed. Like, I, and so I, I switched to another online one where I get to speak a lot more and because that's the hardest part for me now right. is just that brain to mouth, right. uh, all those mechanisms going. So, uh, so I, I've been preaching in English and in Spanish together um, because we still have some people that um, <clears throat> aren't Spanish speakers on our Sunday services. So we're still splitting the field a little bit there. So it just makes all my messages a lot more brief. <laughs> how, how, <laughs> which do you, it's how do you do that where you speak in English and Spanish? Uh, usually I finish a thought and then I do it in Spanish. <laughs> and then, uh, but also we're meeting in our home. So a lot of times it's discussion. And uh, so I, I'm not always trying to translate for everybody. So I think that helps open up the door a lot more. So um, and maybe the burden of of public speaking a little bit um, and, and a lot more interactive. It might be weird if I did like a 40 minute sermon, yeah. you know, with six people in my living room. Um, what was uh, but... what was it like preaching that first time in Spanish? Oh. Well, I think it was probably the inaugural service. Um I mean, I guess well, I'd probably dabbled a little bit. I guess it wasn't as shocking as as much preparation I had to put in for the inaugural service, which was November 12th, uh, 2023. And we had, uh, oh, well, I guess we'll talk about this later, but we had a great turnout. Um, but I did both English and Spanish. So, and a lot of people felt like, oh, okay, I feel way better about you public speaking. But that was me of like, you know, week and a half, it, a translated message that he practiced, other, he other brothers helped me. I, you know, I, I spoke through it. Susan was like editing words, like which <laughs> words through energy, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah. Troublesome for me. And it's it, ironically, it's words that are so similar in English and Spanish, but they sound very different. My brain just, we'll you know, see. yeah, just stumbles on those. Um, so can I, I, I will say when he spoke at the inaugural service, I was so nervous for him. I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, like very tightly wound. And I was sitting next to like a woman who's become one of my best friends here. And she and I both, she's, she speaks three languages, but, and one of them is Dutch. So oh she is like very astute. But um, anyway, she and I were both like, oh, we were so nervous. And I think throughout we kind of relaxed and um if sometimes if Ben was struggling with a word, the whole congregation would answer, like <laughs> answer the word for him. And I was just I honestly just felt like so proud of him because it was so and nobody said nobody was like, dude, your Spanish is right, terrible. Right. Like everybody knows that he's speaking a foreign language right. and people were so like compassionate and empathetic and patient. And I thought he did a really great job. It was it was so hard, but he totally owned it. And like, I think the crowd was like, everyone was so proud of him. So does after your sermons, does Susan give you, a, does she give you a grade? She go, oh, that was a B plus there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not so much in the house church moments, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a, a very different experience to, um, uh, to preach in a, in a different language, Wait, in a different setting. You know, we're in a house church setting now. Way so. to go. That's so exciting. I mean, it just takes so much humility and just swallowing your pride. I felt like that was the toughest part in Japan is like just 
the willingness to appear stupid in front of people is just like the biggest challenge. I mean, just feel, acting like a five-year-old in front of, of people. So good for you. How about for you, Susan? You already knew the language coming into it. Tell me how, how your assimilation has um, been. So, yeah, I, I, I could get around. Um, when we first got here, it was frustrating, I think. And it was like, sometimes it was hard on our marriage because I feel like things that Ben would typically do, I had to do it. It wasn't like a choice um, because he, he literally couldn't communicate with like a client or like a service person. Um, and so I think that was really hard, but I also like had no idea what was going on sometimes. Like, oh, another weird thing is that we use our stove with gas, but we, we, we monthly, monthly or like every six six months to, or six weeks to eight weeks, we have to get a, like a tank of gas, pro, propane gas that you would use for your, like your grill outside. It's under our sink at all times, which is like insane. And I have to use a lighter to light our oven. Um, it just feels so unsafe, but it's like completely normal. Like that's what everybody does. It's safe. But... What, are you, are you t- when you say stove, like your cooking stove? It's powered by like a propane tank. Yes. Yeah. And so it was just one of those moments where like, oh, wait, how do you even get There's not a direct line of gas coming into the stove. Yeah. We have to replace a tank. And it was like, I've never seen these in the grocery store. Like how do we buy a tank? And you like, you get a number and a little, a, a man comes to your house with like a little pickup truck that has like 20 tanks in the back and he brings it in for us and like switches it out. And, but the first time you have to buy the tank. Right. Right. And then, yeah, it's just, it's, then, it's get, then it gets exchanged afterwards. Okay. Yeah. It costs less every time. But like at first, we were like, we just had no idea. Like, <laughs> when, we, um, when we lived in Japan, there was a, we had, we heated the place with what's called Toyu, which is a, a kerosene. And so there was a little truck that would come by and the guy would, you know, fill up, give us, cans of, of kerosene. It's just so funny. Just so different. The life. Yes. It's just so different. So I think that that was really hard. Like, um, even like my, my first probably five or six weeks, I was invited out to dinner with all the moms from our youngest son's grade. And I was like, I'm going like, I'm totally going to go. And we were out till one o'clock in the morning, the, and it wasn't wild. It was not a wild, crazy. It was just a normal day. You were hitting the club with the girls. Is that what you're No, (laughs) no, not at all. uh, Club Panera bread. (laughs) No, it was a nice restaurant, but, but it was just like, everybody was talking so fast. And I was like, oh my gosh, like to be in at a table with a bunch of native speakers and the Uruguayan and Argentinian accent is very strong. It's called the Rio Platense Spanish accent. And instead of saying like, yo me llamo, saying like, I call myself, they say, show me llamo. Uh So for any double L and any Y it's a sh sound. And so it's just like, like it's a big learning curve as far as listening. Cause I'm used to just the yeah noise. Um, and there's a lot of colloquial, they use a tense of like a, not a tense, but a conjugation Conjugation that most of Spanish speaking in America doesn't use. It's vos. Um, so it's just, it's like, wow, there's just so much to learn. I felt like I was drinking from a fire hydrant. I like language. Like it's fun to me to learn. Um, but at times I just felt like totally overwhelmed. If people would call me on the phone, I was like, oh boy, we'll just <laughs> text me like i i can send you a <laughs> and yes i was walking around saying to any person i encountered like the guy at the meat counter at the grocery store the checkout lady whatever i was like i'm learning spanish and sometimes my spanish is painful and i meant to say lento which is slow but instead I was saying lente, which is glasses and everybody would chuckle. And I thought I was so enchanting. I was like, well, I'm just like charming every person. And then after, I am not joking, two to three weeks of me saying that to probably 20 times a day to every person I'm talking to my friend who is Uruguayan, but speaks perfect English goes, you know, you're not saying what you think you're saying. And I was like, what? she was like really sweet. But instead of saying slow, you're saying glasses. And I was like, Oh, 
<laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so. I love that. Okay, well, how have, the, how have the kids done? Are they going to school? Like, how old are your kids again, and what, what are they doing? Yeah, I think that was our biggest fear with moving our family and three kids. Like, okay, it's, it's not us, you know, just work stuff. But um, yeah, in fact, the the first day they went to school, uh, they loved it. Um, it. It felt like God really took care of us in that form. So our kids go to a bilingual school of English and Spanish. And God's provided for that because we help raise that money outside of our, our salary um, for people to donate towards. So, um, so, uh, and so we do usually at dinner time. We ask, "What was the best part of your day?" Every kid said school, hmm. uh, and they got to go for a test run in March to go for a day just to kind of experience when we came for a spring break. But this was like full on school uniforms uh, kind of thing, a full day's worth. So, so they go four hours in Spanish, four hours in English every day. Um, at least one of all of their teachers can speak English. No one's like, I don't, I think my daughter may have a native speaker English, but nobody in the school is a native speaker of English. Um, but it's wonderful. Like it's literally on the beach. Um, (laughs) they play outside two and a half hours every day. Wow. Uh, every Friday, our oldest kids take a bus and go to uh, like a big sports field outside of the city. And they have sports training for four hours outside. And they just like, they don't understand. I tried to explain like, um, what's it called? Testing the, st- like the state testing, like the standardized testing. Right. And they were like, why, why would you make children do that? And I was like, I know. Yeah. Explain <laughs> um, about the at the school there. So, <laughs> so uh, it's really good. Our youngest I would say is a fluent Uruguayan Spanish speaker. Wow. He he doesn't like to speak like to us. I mean he will, <laughs> but we had a play date at our house the other day and he had two friends over and I was like, oh my heart. Like <laughs> he just speaks so well Spanish. Um and I think and it's he's like seven. Yeah, he's seven. I think it's like kicking the other kids' butts that they're yeah. not. Like, <laughs> How old are your other kids? So you have a boy who's seven. Uh-huh. Yeah, another boy who's 10 and our oldest is our daughter uh, and she's 11. Okay. So they have like, they have, they get pulled out for a Spanish tutor twice. And then like during their English classes, cause they don't, it's not as vital. Um, and then they, but they have kind of chosen friends that can speak English better and because they're in like upper grades, their their classmates just speak English better. And also we're the only Spanish or English speaking family at the school, the only one. It's I would say it's mostly Uruguayan and a couple of Argentinian families, yeah. some Brazilians. Um, but when I feel like when we invite people over, they're like, Ooh, English camp, send your kids. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah. So, uh, they're, they're doing well. I think our daughter is like getting into like adolescence. And so sometimes she really misses home. The other two, they're very excited to travel back to the States, but I think that they're happy, like in school, they have friends, you know, the first day of school, our son, a mom came up to me in Spanish and she was like, uh, you're, you're Carter's mom. Right. And I was like, yep. And she was like, there's a birthday party for the third graders. Um, can Carter come? My daughter wants him to come. And I was like, okay I don't know where it is we don't have a car she was like I'll drive him it's fine and I was like wait where is it and so he went with like a woman I've never met before to a birthday party and then I texted her and I was like how's it going and she was like oh I dropped them off I have no idea but this mom is gonna bring him home I arranged a ride and I was like oh my god but he, he made it home and I was like, how was it? He was like, best day of my life. And I'm like, that sounds like a setup for a Liam Neeson taken movie or something like that. <laughs> Where's my kids? Yes, no, the, the birthday culture here is like so strong. Wild. Wow. So I understand now, but I was like, be a cool mom, Susan, be a cool mom, right. be a cool mom. Right. Carter was like, please, can I go? Please, 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 please. And I was like, you know what? Sure. What's what's the crime level like there? Do you feel pretty safe in general? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Susan's about to share a story where her phone got stolen, Uh-oh. but generally, yes, and and for South America, definitely, yes, um, it's, it's it's just like petty theft. Okay, 
Like if you leave stuff visibly in your car, someone will break in and steal it. If you're, I was like texting like this at a bus stop and someone literally rode their bicycle by and stole my phone out of my hand. What? And there was like no chance that I was going to get it back. No chance. And, and then like, since then I've heard so many stories of phone stealings, even a woman was on the bus and somebody grabbed her cell phone through the window and like kept going. Oh my gosh. So it's like, it's, if you have an iPhone, everybody wants an iPhone. So I just take it. Wow. Okay. Well, um, talk, talk to me, how has God worked over the past year? Tell me what it's been like trying to reach out in, in this foreign country. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of have a two approach, probably like many people where, okay, um, who are, who are, you know, just making friendships and connections. I think like that, um, Luke 10 scripture, you know, people of peace, staying at home eating. So I I think that front has been, um, uh, uh, amazing for us and just connecting with other people, especially having kids, other parents, other married couples, Mm -hmm. And so, but that's slow, right? I mean, you're, you're building a relationship for the sake of, of relationships. And sometimes, you know, uh, God creates opportunities to share the gospel in a very meaningful way. Uh, the other one is, you know, just more cold contacts going, uh, you know, the sidewalks or public spaces like plazas or parks or um, the universities uh, to meet people. Uh, and that one is a little bit harder in the region of South America that we're in. Um, Argentina and um, and Uruguay are very European um, in in their culture. So, um, although they're Latin American, um, I, I think if, if you're in Europe, <laughs> you feel like oh, they're definitely European. So, uh, although I might have offend a few Uri- uh, Uruguayans by saying that, um, but this feels way more like Europe than Latin America to me. Um, and I feel like they would not feel offended. They would yeah, maybe they're not uh, that offended. Uh, but there's a whole history behind it. Um, but uh, that comes with it. And and so our, our brothers and sisters in Buenos Aires had already been kind of coaching us through this. Like, um, you know, you you have to work through relationships, and they'd say that the mission field will be slow and low um, in growth. Like it's just building relationships over a long period of time, uh, God granting opportunities, but Hey, when they get baptized, they're just solid disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, but we're always fishing for the, just people who are sensitive to the gospel and, uh, how it might be sharing our faith. And, uh, and so here we get maybe the more spiritually sensitive people, (laughs) but not necessarily sensitive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, some examples are, I came across a man who prays to angels of death. And I was like, I I don't know what that is. Is that something from the Bible? And he goes, no. And and then he lifts up his shirt and shows me tattoos of, you know, these angels of death that he prays to every day. And I was like, okay, um, that's one way to do it. Um, witchcraft seems to be like somewhat more popular here. Um, there's, uh, there people go to the, to the river to not not sacrifice like a, they're not sacrificing anything, Uh, almost like a, like a well-wishing thing. Like you'd throw coins into like a, like a shopping mall fountain or something. Right. So, so there's some of that. So there's some, like, if you're like, hey, are you a spiritual person? Um, you're pulling on the wrong threads with some people. Um, and then I think then then there's kind of like that intellectual, atheistic, secularism type that's here um, where they're willing to talk through things, um, but they lack like a, like a Christian cultural context. Like one of the young men I studied the Bible with in, in um, Edgardo from Tucson, um, this young man named Guzman. Uh, and I was like, you know, oh, we'd love for you to come to church. And he's like, oh yeah, it sounds, sounds great. And, uh, but then he was confused that we had church every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just like one of those things. He's like, wait, you guys meet every Sunday. And all of, all of a sudden, like the commitment felt like such a burden. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, so it, it's moments like that, you know, there's, there's just not the stories of the Bible. Many of the yeah. other dads have never stepped foot in a church ever before, even for a wedding or a funeral. 
And so that's usually my follow-up question. I was like, oh, you've never been to a church before? I mean, it's almost 100% no. And um, so I'm like, not even for a wedding or a funeral. And so, yeah, just kind of curious here. It's the uh, Catholicism never really got a foothold in this area of South America. And, it, and its, you know, separation of state has been super strong for, you know, probably like three generations. So, uh, so I can see it's like a little bit of a harder mission field uh, from that perspective, <laughs> But it just feels crazy. Like every person that I meet, it's you can see the need for the gospel. And you're like, man, I wish if you just take a week of discipleship, like just test run it, just test run the product. You know what I mean? Might help to open up the doors. But I think it's like, you know, you're just trying to create something almost out of nothing. It's wow. they've already written it off like, oh, people still read the Bible kind of moments and um so anyway so it's kind of curious like that so i don't know if you have anything to add or i mean i just feel like subtract the moment you say like church to people they're kind of like oh no um and so i found like even when we're at the park specifically to like cold contact share it's more like i just try to sit down and have conversations with people like, Hey, how are you? Like, I'm just trying to be basically like American friendly <laughs> and, um, strike up conversations. I met a lot of great people that way. Um, and then it's very natural to share my faith because they're like, well, why do you live here? Um, and I can share like, Oh, we're, I was sharing like we're ministers and people are always like, Oh, are you Mormon? I'm like, no. Um, so, I mean, it's easy, but it's like, I think instantly you, you get to see like, who's like, Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Or people that are like, I mean, I had one person be like, good luck. Yeah. Um, so, which is fine. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just the cold contact hasn't, it's never been my favorite thing. It's, it's like, it's easier to do it on a college campus, but even here, like, it's just not normal at all. And I think it comes with so much opposition. Like, it's like, it's hard to get just like, no, 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 over and over and over again. So we've just been like working through relationships. Um, so like Ben plays in a, it's called poppy football, which means like dad soccer, yeah. dad, daddy soccer. And um, I actually, out of sheer loneliness, started a walking and running group for women and I had asked like a lot of people from school, like, oh, does anybody walk or run or whatever? I like to run. Everyone's like, no. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was on expatriate groups and I have like a Saturday group that is like sometimes like over 20 women. We like flood a cafe afterwards wow. and um, it's really fun. But I do feel like that, that walk, that run time allows like, just deep conversation. Yeah. And so we've had like lots of friends come to church, um, through that, that group as well. And then like, obviously picking up and dropping off our kids and going to birthday parties and going to family events at the school, we get to meet a lot of people from the school and, you know, play dates and things like that. And then what's the other, what's the other thing? Uh, language. Like a, we do an English Spanish, um, uh, language exchange. Yeah. And um, that, that's that been helpful, especially, you know, just doing Spanish classes and some of that here helps to reach out to those people who are also learning Spanish. Or want to learn English and right. like hang out with native right. English speakers. So that's like every Thursday evening. Okay. So it sounds like it's been pretty challenging. Okay. <laughs> Have you had any baptisms? No. Okay. So you still work. Anyone studying the Bible? Great question. <laughs> Uh, not studying the Bible yet, but in the works. So I, I think we've studied the Bible, like the men's side, we've studied with seven men since I've been here and none have gotten past discipleship. So, um, and right now I, I have, I have an, <laughs> not a newer wine guy, a guy from India that we're looking to set up Bible studies when I come back from the States but um uh, literally he knows nothing about the bible and in fact i was like uh, what could you tell me about jesus 
And he's like, well, I know uh, people were upset with them. Then they killed him. And then they thought, oh, we made a huge mistake. And they started to talk about his teachings. And I was like, well, you know, he raised from the dead. He's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay. Oh, and that man. was like a party we were at uh, this last weekend. So, um, and, uh, and then that was the guy I had lunch with today. That's where I felt like. Oh, I, I kind of need to get this guy. I need to get another time in there before I really leave town. Oh so. my gosh. Okay. So when you, when you guys landed, how much, how many people did you start with? Like when you, everything considered, I knew there was a, I think you mentioned there were a few people that were there already had, that were kind of natives, but had been, you know, from a different converted in a different place and then you're gathering some different people. So what kind of a team did you have when you started? How many people do you have now? The beginning of our, our mission team was a curious one, one of, uh, of an interesting birth, I suppose. So, um, uh, they, uh, Buenos Aires had been a big part of the sending process. Um, and so they had been doing zoom calls, uh, since the pandemic of people who had been interested in joining Montevideo. Uh, I think the hardship that happened is that um, I, I often call uh, from a biblical stance that Uruguay is like the Jericho of uh, of South America because um, the standard of living is a lot higher. Um, and so it has this high financial wall for other South Americans to come in that makes it very difficult. Um, so we only had one South American join our team and everyone else was North American from, from the U.S. The only hybrid we had was from Tucson and that was Edgardo mm -hmm. who grew up in Honduras, but his adult life, uh, you know, 20 years, um, you know, in the United States. So, um, so we were um, six Americans and uh, one South American from Colombia. Um, and then we were expecting that three women were, um, you know, there to receive us. It turned out to be one. And, and so it just became this hardship where I think Argentina intended, okay, we'd like to send some people. There's another family who thought, okay, by January 24, so seven months of us being there, they would move. But because of circumstances, it just hasn't worked out. And Got they it. kept pushing that back and then now they're not sure so it's a lot of moments where it's like okay south americans wanted to come it just wasn't working out so so there's uh, a so we're there's like an economic barrier there's like a, a hurdle for people to get in there so that must have been challenging okay so it's been challenging to form a team that can stay because i know ed has moved back to tucson back to the states and yeah. so you guys must be struggling just to maintain a team at this point yeah, and Edgardo was so um such a wonderful gift to our team because he could he was bilingual and he could sing and play the guitar. So not having him is like, oh so sad. <laughs> he was um, our worship team. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you feel that way about him. He is a wonderful person and I'm so happy that he went, you know, as an emissary yeah. from the Tucson church. He's such a great guy. So yeah. Oh boy. Um but yeah, so right now it's um, Ben and I and uh, one sister who is coming in September, one sister who actually leaves tomorrow, I think, and is going on like a two and a half month summer trip back to the States. And um, she'll be coming back in September as well. And that's it. Um, and we have a, an Uruguayan sister as well. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really small. So right now we are, we are definitely looking particularly, <laughs> especially families yeah. um, that, that would help our family too. So you're looking yeah. for families. Okay. Let's just talk about this. Cause how, how do you deal with discouragement? Okay. That would be discouraging. I'm sure you're, you're wrestling with it. Every missionary does. How do you, how do you deal with it? Like, what do you do? How do you pump yourself up? Keep your faith in a, in a challenging situation? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. So we're open for any encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> we're always open to new ideas. <laughs> I think that some, I'm very grateful to God that we have three kids and we have to like maintain normal life. Yeah. 
Um, because, you know, we have to go take them to school and pick them up. And, um, so rhythms of life, I think are important for us. Um, you know, cooking dinner every day and it just all that stuff that goes into family life. Um, I think that definitely keeps us going. And, you know, we have silly moments where we're dancing and singing and laughing. Yesterday, the kids had a holiday from school. We recently bought a car. And so we were able to go out and go hiking. And we visited this beautiful beach that was giving big Anne of Green Gables vibes, (laughs) if you know what I mean, Rob. And um, it was just, it was a wonderful day. And I think that that sort of helps as well as I think running and working out. I was, a, I was, I just let my gym membership lapse cause we we're about to go home, but, um, but going to the gym, um, going to classes and then, uh, going for runs. I think my Saturday group is like really fun and helpful. And so I think those sorts of things, um, having things to look forward to, I think is really important. And, um, our daughter was just cast as Wednesday in the Adams family play at school. And so we have that to look forward to. Um, I think just, just little things like that, um, are encouraging. I mean, we're, we're about to go to the States for like 15 days, I think. So I think, I think we're looking forward to that as well. And my brother just visited, which was, so encouraging. Um, and we went to Buenos Aires and my niece came and it was a huge surprise. So I think all of those things have helped. Um, but, but yeah, I, it's really hard. Yeah. I, I think I do feel very sensitive and very vulnerable. Like discouragement can come from, from anywhere. It feels like at any time, um, because we're not, we're not here. This is not our, our normal culture and being in. So I feel like we're constantly being shocked I'm doing something new I've never done in my life before, like every week, especially when we were first here, it felt like every hour I was doing something I'd never done before, you know, at, at 38, I suppose. So, but then I'm responsible for my wife and kids too. Um, so I, I think there, it, it's just a lot, but I think it also, I mean, I, I feel like I, my imagination around scripture, I feel like has really grown because I feel like I'm finding myself in, um, you know, so many situations uh, that were just stories to me, where I'm like, oh, this is what it's like to move away from home outside of your culture. Like, I was even thinking about Abraham. I was like, did these people even speak the same language as Abraham? Right. You know, just like, moments I wouldn't have thought about that before. And then now I'm like, oh, man, it's like super discouraging, because you can't have a deep talk with some of your newer friends here because you don't speak the same language. Um, And so I think there's just moments like that where it's just like, okay, it's really hard to experience the hospitality of a culture, sometimes with language barriers um, that are there. And then I think sometimes just the loneliness of leadership, like, you know, sometimes it's hard to just the vulnerabilities of being the church leader and and turn to the missionaries and be like, well, isn't this a hard week? (laughs) Uh, You know what I mean? You feel like, all right, let's look for the good. Right. Um, And uh, so I think there's moments where we're like, okay, let's, what's the honest truth? Like, what are we experiencing? And then sometimes as missionaries, we disagree, which I think can make it hard and we can have conflict. You think we're a small group, you know, we'd be, we'd be like a family ourselves, but when there's conflict, it can feel so desperate of like, oh my, don't break up the family. Right, right. Uh, and, and so anyway, so I, I think it's, I think I can feel very sensitive, which might make me want to be a little bit more people pleasing at times. So I think that feels a little bit more of a, of a danger for me, I think yeah. here mm-hmm. than it was being in the States where I felt like I could be a little bit more confident and sure of myself. So. Right. Well, you're, you're such a smart person. You guys are both super smart and super achievers. So that's frustrating when you're, you want something to happen so badly and it's, it's not happening like you want. And in another circumstance, any other field, any other area, it would be. And yet it's just, it's, it's challenging and you can't control people. You can't, you can't force it. So I I know that that's, frustrating for you. I'd definitely be praying for you. And I, I'm reminded of William Carey. He was one of the early missionaries to, yeah. to India. I think his first conversion happened five or 10 years in. I mean, it, it just took such a long time to, to get a foothold. So I know it does take patience. Let me talk a little bit about, let's talk about money. 
Argentina is, you know, in the news for hyperinflation, 300%. I mean, the government yeah. seems like it's under fire. I mean, it's all just a huge mess, at least from the U.S. news perspective. But Montevideo and Uruguay is completely different. So what's what's the difference? What's happening? They're they're adjacent to each other. They're I mean, you're not very far from Buenos Aires. So what's happening? I actually just went there two weekends ago, two weeks ago, and um, they don't even like. It's very interesting. On their menus, it's like a wipe away marker that they change the prices every day. It's wild. Um, but your salary is not changing like that though. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's really wild. So, yeah. um, no, they just had, they had an election in October, I think, and everything changed They're They're trying to better the economy. So inflation is necessary. I mean, <clears throat> we went there in September and everything was like so inexpensive. And, um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, yeah, it's just going through, it's, it's going through that, like, it's getting worse before it gets better situation. Um, and so, yeah, pray for our brothers and sisters there because it is really hard. But Montevideo has been stable for a very long time. What What is so, it? Can you give a quick quick economic summary of like what's different about that country that you're in? Go ahead. No, yeah. I, I think the things that helps out with Uruguay is that um, they ended up divorcing themselves from the Argentinian economy uh, more than uh, themselves. So their biggest export is beef. Like that is their thing, cows. And um, so that, that's that been steady for them, but it is a small country. It's the smallest populous Spanish speaking country in the world. So it's, it's like uh, the size of by landmass, maybe like Oklahoma and the population of Oklahoma. Yeah. So if Oklahoma was like its own country in the middle of the United States is a little bit what Uruguay can be. So um, so I think it it gets this reputation of being kind of like a Switzerland and South America uh, thing where they kind of, they highlight privatization. I didn't say that right, but <laughs> privatization. That's the, okay, whatever. I'm learning a second language. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they privatize so many things. In fact, there's not a lot of American influence like that because American banks don't like that aspect. So, um, and so there's no American bank here. Like, so we had to restart everything from scratch um, here. But like, for in, okay, like a good wait, example, wait a second, let me let me go back. So, they've nationalized yeah. or they privatized? Would so what do? You... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think my economic professor would want me to say that they're a socialist country, um, but there's a very capital capitalistic attitude to it. I, I, the economy works in the same way like it would in the U.S., but I think they scaled it appropriately to their size. Um, so there's not a lot of foreign influence that comes into Montevideo. Um, and, and then American influence, it's kind of repelled a little bit because things are so it's not so open how much money you have in your bank account. You know, I, I think the American bank accounts want all that to be open information. Uh, and so I think that's what Switzerland gets known for, right? You're laundering money and you're putting it through Switzerland or something. Okay. U.S. banks don't know whether you have that money or not. I think Uruguay can have that example, but they don't have uh, corruption here. It is so bureaucratic, <laughs> which is American. I understand. <laughs> We've all been through those DMV lines. It's just a DMV line everywhere you go. Mm. So I think it's frustrating to some other South Americans because I think they're like, okay, who's the guy I got to pay to get this thing done? Right. And it just doesn't happen that, happen that way. It's like, oh, no, you need Uruguayan birth certificates. That office is open between 930 <laughs> and 1130 and you have a number. <laughs> And, and so, you know, it's just like one of those things where it's like, okay, like here you are, you have to wait a year's time wow. um, before you can get anything done. Oh uh, in fact, we are some close friends of ours who are New Zealanders. Uh, his work is just sending him home <laughs> because they're, it's just taking too long right. for them to get the business going. Got it. So, so are you guys, um, are you guys on a, a tourist visa? Are you guys on a missionary visa? What kind of a status do you have? So we are residents in transit right now, which means we're trying to get residency right now. So we don't uh, actually have to have a visa to be here. So 
Okay. Um, right. So they allow Americans to be here for 90, 90 days. days without anything. Then you have, all you have to do is like cross the river and go to Argentina or go to Brazil, which is also close and then come back. And then your 90 days restarts again. Got it. So there's like a lot of people that are living here without even like even going for residency, but you can't do much without an ID. So like even our kids have IDs. So we, we have, we're, we're residents in transit. There's just like a few legal documents that we're waiting to get cleared on. Okay. But it's a two-year prospect. Right? It's a two-year prospect to get the citizenship uh, or. Legal. We're hoping. No citizen, that's resident, that's residency. Got it. Got it. Okay. How are you guys supporting yourself? Oh, uh, okay. Great question. So we work through the South American Mission Society, but we receive from uh, Central Jersey is the church. Their special mission supports our salary and a little bit of the the the, the, bur the budget for the church here. Got it. Um, so we're solely supported by Central Jersey, who gives to the South American Mission Society, who then pays us. Awesome. Okay. Uh, okay. So, great. And, and we're we're both full time in the ministry here. So. Okay. So what's you know, when you look back, what's been the most inspirational? It's been challenging, but what's been, where have you seen God at work? Um, yeah, I think for here, it's been, I, I think, um, the moments for the church where it's not necessarily been like a Sunday service, um, but we've done like a Friendsgiving or like a Christmas party or someone's birthday party. And then it just feels like all the work that we've done, people that we met just pour out and we have you know, an asado, like an outdoor barbecue and people come out and it's just amazing and it's fun. I feel like I'm always chasing those mo moments because that's what I want the church to feel like. Right. It just feels like family. we can cook out, we can laugh, we can say the honest truths to each other and still be connected <laughs> Um, and so I think there's some aspects of, of the culture that I really admire and I could feel like, wow, if you just threw, you know, like a Bible scripture and communion in here, this would be a great church experience. <laughs> and like even my my dad's soccer team through our kids school is, you know, they'll have these barbecues like once a quarter. We play soccer, you know, Sunday morning together. Um, I think, you know, in the same way some Americans might say their religion is baseball right. or watching right. sports, uh, for them, it's it's soccer here. I mean, it's, you know, they play into their 40s and 50s, um, you know, with with these dad groups they and like they watch it and, 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 and soccer is just huge here. Like they're professional league and there's like D leagues and it's a it's a country of like three million people. You think like, you know, it, it, you know, someone in your family played professional here. Like it's, there's just not enough people. <laughs> right. Feels right. Like. Well, I think they were yeah. one of the early winners of the World Cup. I mean, back in the 30s or 40s yeah. or they something. They hosted the first World Cup. Every Uruguayan just fell in love with you, Rob, for you knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> I know a few things there. That's that's interesting. Plus, if you know, like the, the more famous football player here, do you know him? No, sorry. Okay. He's in Miami right now, Luis Suarez. Luis Suarez. Okay. Okay. He's on the side of him. So what's your plan going forward? It, it's been, you know, tough, tough first year. You've gotten assimilated. Your language, your language skills, skills obviously are doing much better. You, you must be much more comfortable. You've gotten, yeah. gotten used to the culture, the environment. What's your plan for year two? Wait, before I, an before I answer, can I share like what has been my most encouraging moments? Oh, please um, do. So I think that um, like the, the relationship building, I think sometimes I'm just in awe. Like we, I had a friend once who just spent the day with me. It was during summer, I think summer. And um, our daughters are really good friends. And so she spent the day with me and she ended up like just, hanging around the whole day. And then she, she, I was like, well, we're going to have a midweek like devotional. And she was like, oh yeah, I'll stay. And she came to our inaugural service. Um, but she was raised Catholic. So she's like, I, I can't even tell my mom I came to church with you. She's like 45, you know? <laughs> um, but she shared at the, the midweek service, like 
this is what this country needs. Like you guys are what this country needs. Like, please keep on going. Or, you know, I received a message from another a woman the other day that I, I, we were friends and she said, I'm visiting my sister. And I, I went to like a Bible discussion that she has with some women once a week where they just kind of check in with one another and they share a scripture and they just talk about their lives. And like, do you do that? Could we do that? You know, like just those moments where like God opens a door where you're like, Oh, oh, that's I, and I think I'm starting to like, learn to appreciate the smaller things. Um, you know, like even the other night we took our kids to McDonald's with another friend and her child. And she just started asking Ben and I all these religious or like spiritual Bible questions. And it was like, Oh, I like, wasn't expecting that, you know? Um, so I think that like those, those moments when God opens the door that you just like, you didn't even see. Um, and so I think just learning to appreciate those more rather than like the big, the really big moments, I think mm-hmm. has kind of helped my, my faith and also even just my gratitude and connection with God. Right. Right. So plans for a year two. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think one of the things we learned is that God can do a lot with a little and, you know, with a smaller mission team than we expected, you know, we've consistently had visitors to church on Sunday and have these big barbecues with like, you know, 30, 40 people. And so you can see the work it's growing. It's just, it just feels like we're constantly tilling the soil. (laughs) Um, but, uh, you know, that's fine. I think a lot of the mission fields could probably relate with that. Um, but for this second year, I think, uh, the biggest thing we need is missionaries. We just need, um, people to be here. Um, one of our bigger priorities is just to have missionaries, uh, to not necessarily be missionaries, but to have some permanence here in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, so we felt like families might be the easiest way to be able to do that, but people who can move here, who could work here, um, and just be a part of the church, um, you know, for some sort of longevity, um, and not necessarily just, you know, a, 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 you know, an honorable sacrifice to the Lord of a year of your life. Um, and, but, you know, we need that too, uh, that helps. So our our priority right now with our mission society is we're trying to get a a lot of native Spanish speakers, um, uh, to, to jump on board with us. So that's what we're currently, uh, trying to do. Um, but also we're very, uh, welcoming towards Americans. And I think Uruguay is a pretty great place for Americans to come. I think it's it, it's pretty safe. I mean, we're American too, so you're already linked to the church where um, you're, you're not going to be flailing necessarily. We just went through it so and experienced it here. But um, so um, we're very open uh, to that. But I think we're we're just um, you know the idea of this next year. If, you know, if anything happens to us, we'll feel like the church will immediately collapse. And that's, um, and, and that just kind of feels scary. Right. Exactly. Uh, as but I think there's a part of me that just really hopes for, you know, just the kingdom at large to, um, you know, answer the call, right. Um, to really help us out for, for the mission here, um, uh, in Uruguay. So I think that's the biggest thing we're looking for is, you know, some, some missionaries who could have some permanence here in this country and, um, you know, as well as just you know, anyone who can devote some, some amount, uh, you know, some substantial amount of time uh, right. to be here. If someone were, that, if someone were interested in going, how much, how much would it cost if a person were going thinking, I, I'd like to go, like, how much would they need? Like if it's a single person and they, let's say they want to rent a studio or a one bedroom place, how much would it cost them to, to, to live? What, what, what would be enough money to, to get by for 12 months? Well, it just depends on the lifestyle that you want to live truly. Like our, our house is not expensive. It's significantly less expensive than what we were paying in the States. And, um, it just depends if they're like looking to long-term rent an Airbnb that gets really expensive because, you know, if you want amenities and you want a fully furnished place, it just, it just depends if you're willing to have roommates or not. So I would say somewhere between like 500 and 1200 a month for like a, an apartment. If you, if you weren't looking to furnish it yourself, it, things like that, like just depends. Yeah. 
I would say probably about 1200 is probably a good marker to, um, you know, to be in this country. I, it, it does feel a lot like the United States as far as the cost of living. I, I mean, maybe not, you know, some of the larger cities like, you know, maybe in LA or New York, like, no, but, um, uh, but probably in smaller town, US will, will probably feel similar. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think that's, uh, it, it's more expensive. And I think that was a hardship because even the brother from Columbia was um, like, he lived in a hostel his, his whole time here and living off rice and beans. So, and just using public transit <laughs> some of the time, otherwise he'd walk the city, he'd walk for, you know, an hour and a half or something to, uh, to get to places. Wow. So, wow. But I mean, we also have a sister who is living in a furnished apartment with roommates for about four fifty a month, um, and she also used public transit, and like she really it wasn't big issues. Um, so I, I it just depends. Like it depends what kind of lifestyle you want. Right. I think they they do genuinely when they see an American coming, it's like dollar signs flashing. Got it. So. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Okay. So a person, a single person could definitely get down there for 1500 to 2000 a month and live comfortably for a year. I think, I think everything yeah. included. Okay, great. That's good to know. Well, Ben and Susan, thank you so much for your time praying for you. Hope you have a great uh, time back in the States and just get encouraged and energized and we'll definitely be praying for you for the, for the church there and for your work. I just think it's it's heroic and it's exciting what you've done. I we didn't really cover it, but I I think you had a big inaugural service. I mean that that was really encouraging. I saw pictures of it and you had a ton of people. How many people showed up for that service? I believe it's seventy four. Wow. Uh, uh, Thirty were Argentinians, so uh, it is great for them to really come out. But we had a great number of friends come and. Uh, there's one Uruguayan from Buenos Aires that brought his mother, his sister, and a friend. So, yeah, um, uh, so that was just like a great experience for that. The Uruguayan woman here is married, and her husband came. Um, so, uh, so it, I know it was huge for her, um, just just to have that that victory. It, I think it all helped us to really dream. So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for your work. Thank you for everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for listening. Here's how you can help support the program. First of all, share your favorite episodes with your friends. Let people know about it. Secondly, read and review one of my books, either How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. You can find them on Amazon.com. And finally, support the program with a gift today. The link is in the show notes. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no-regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day, and make this life count.